Okay, thank you everybody for uh, joining us here again. This is uh, the last session, not only of today, but also of the, this year's UPU World Leaders Forum. And uh, we started this morning with the topic of sustainability. We had a lot of input, insights, uh, a lot of visionary views on, on different aspects, of course, on sustainability. And now we want to dig a bit deeper. And I will briefly introduce the panel, which we are having with us here, all experts, of course, in sustainability. We have Katrin Isotam, she is the head of communications and ESG at Omniva. We have Andreas Stoney, he is the EVP Group Strategy Digital and Innovation at Austria Post. We have Colin Campbell, he is the Senior Vice President Sustainability at Norway Post. And we have James Hale, he is expert sustainability services at the UPU. And I suggest that we start hearing from what uh, Omniva is doing in the area of sustainability and learn a bit more about all your projects, initiatives, and maybe some use cases. Please. Mm -hmm. Can I have that one? The clicker. Okay. Hi, everybody. Nice to be here. Um, I have like five minutes or slightly more. So the idea was to uh, briefly tell you what is, what is the strategic frame we are coming from and then maybe bring a couple of fun or cool cases that we are actually working with to, to be of hopefully of inspiration. Um, if, we try, if I try to summarize what we do uh, in a nutshell, I would say that the framework is consisting of three focuses or, or key strategic areas we are working with and uh, six related uh, UN sustainability goals. So first of all, of course, logically, we are in the logistics and transportation, so we definitely have an impact on environment and we need to work with, with becoming greener and cleaner. Um, we have set, uh, well, uh, you can see the picture here, we are using walk bikes, we are testing Paxter bikes that are also available for testing here at the mess or at the fair. Uh, we are changing our fleet, all that is basically becoming a hygiene, I would say. So uh, currently Omniva is pretty much in the beginning of that journey. We have less than 10% uh, of our fleet electric, but we have ambitious plans for the coming years. Uh, an example that is maybe a bit less um, mm, kind of spread or, or maybe interesting to see is that we are Besides having solar energy at our logistics centers, we have pretty big uh, solar parks. Uh, we are currently building a big logistics center in the Baltics in Kaunas, and that solar park will be like free uh, football um, uh, court sizes or, or something like that. We are also testing solar energy on our uh, mobile uh, parcel lockers and our parcel lockers overall. So this one is from Latvian market and on very good and sunny days it does, it produces more than uh, more than 100% of the energy needs. So actually a pretty good use case to to be hopefully expanded and we are having the, those uh, solar panels on our mobile lockers in in Estonia uh, currently as well. So the overall goal is then minus 50% by 2030 and then net zero by 2050. And we are compiling all sorts of plans to, to back those ambitions plans up. Uh, secondly, uh, what we want to be as a, as a business vision, we want to be preferred uh, logis logistics service provider in the region. And we strongly believe that a lot of that comes with being uh, innovative in terms of, uh, of technologies we exploit and test in terms of our services and everything. Because out of that, uh, what we have or will have is a better customer service, uh, better customer service satisfaction. Also better security and privacy being high up uh, on the list uh, also for ESG. Uh, better accessibility and so forth. This one is a cool example of a uh, smart locker system that people or households or, or apartment buildings can have uh, literally at their doorstep. It's a smart system and it is open network, so it's open for our competition as well. Um, we are currently have about 800 across Estonia. We of course want to, want to expand and do similar stuff uh, further on. Uh, third, uh, last but not least, it's all about people. It's all about the S of ESG, right? So. Uh, our focus starts with our own people. We are a large employer in the Baltics. Uh, we have about 2,500 people. We want them to be happy, obviously, uh, treated well, engaged well, etc. We want them to be diverse. The team that is diverse, I, ho I hope we all agree, is uh, producing best results. So uh, yes, we follow gender diversity, but we also fo follow broader diversity, meaning that we have 11 mother tongues, for instance, uh, at our employees, employee base. 
And of course, we want people with different backgrounds, different ages, and so on and so forth. And then we extend to communities because Omniva, Estonian Post in Estonia and Omniva in the Baltics, we, are, we, have, we have the largest infrastructure. We are really close to people. So we do work very close with communities trying to, to meet all sorts of needs. Uh, for instance, one of the things we do in Estonia, where we are further away than five kilometers from, from a person, we provide uh, for free personal delivery so people can always use our services if they are a bit further away, because Estonia famously is like, you know, mm, scarcely populated, so to say. Uh, so uh, then we do, do provide services uh, to be still very much accessible for everybody. So once again, environment, our own business being long term and sustainable uh, and sort of treating the communities around us in a sustainable way, because we believe that then we will have a better chance of, of being alive and being prosperous in the future as well. And then the people uh, that we want to treat with, um, with respect and dignity and so forth. Those are the, the three main focuses that we have. And um, so it is. Uh, what we do today is, is clearly affecting how tomorrow will look like. So uh, there's a famous saying about sustainability. So if everybody cle cleaned their doorstep, the world would be clean, right? So I guess uh, we are starting from ourselves. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much, Katrin. Austria Post is very active in sustainability. It really a forerun in several different areas when it comes to sustainability. Andreas, can you explain a bit more about what you're doing? Sure. Thank you for your invitation and having me here. So I'm coming from the strategy side. So why is that and why I'm here? Um, we believe that it's tightly linked. There's a tight link between strategy and sustainability. So we have a quite long-term strategic um, roadmap and pillars that are set in stone for years, but we revamped this in 2020 to include also sustainability more strictly. And what this looks like is that we have our overall corporate strategic framework in, in four pillars with in the center sustainability, but also diversity and customer orientation. And that was a key change for us that we said, we have to do this for everything what we do. And we put this into the center already in 2020. And we see now over the last actually three, four years that this is, it was the right choice to do that because everybody's talking about that and it's the key. Um, and by doing so, we also had a good cultural change that people f see that it's important that our CEO and our board talks about it and also stresses the importance to keep this in all um, what we are doing. This is along with the three goals we're having from, from our core business and growth and also a new products we're doing in the, in the business of SMEs and private customers. But I want to talk about the center there. And here we, as also Omniva and all, many others, have also the three pillars in terms of goals we want to grow. Obviously, there is the, the whole area about revenue and showing economic performance and being there also in the future, compensating the mailing client, having also the e-commerce business and so on. Um, but also strict goals for the environment. And there, our key and flagship goal basically is the 100% carbon-free um, delivery in Austria until 2030, which is a very strict roadmap because that means that we move completely to e-vehicles. We have already um, the largest fleet of e-vehicles in Austria. We're talking about 4,000 of them. The first ones introduced early in the 2010s. So we are already coming to the question of what we are doing with the second generation of vehicles, how we use the first generation that is replaced, um, second life battery questions and so on. Um, and obviously also the other goals that we are having on the scope one, two and three emissions in line with the goals of the um, climate agreements and so on. Um, next year, we want to be the 2040. And then there's the social part. Um, we really see this element that we want to foster also women in executive positions with a target of 40% there, but this is also one goal and there are multiple in it. In general, we have roughly 14 um, projects or programs that all build on this to make it implemented and to make it work. Maybe one view that summarizes our journey a little bit is um, this one last slide to keep it short and crisp. So our footprint in terms of carbon emissions is 
in three areas. It's about the delivery and letter uh, of letters and parcels. It's about transport logistics and about buildings. Over the years now, since 2009 till now, we did a very good job, I think, in terms of reducing it in buildings. Um, it might not look like a good job in some other areas, but we kept the other in total it flat, even though we had an increase in transport volumes of 70%. So we were able to compensate for this. And now the journey is going towards 2030, basically capping the yellow part. In, we're now talking about Austria, but in the whole group, we have similar plans to move these directions. Now we're not so fast in our CE countries. So Austrian Post operates in 13 countries, most of them being in CE. T Turkey, a major one also um, on that. And the other challenge, and it's still a challenge for the whole industry, I guess, and will be for us is transport logistics. So the question will be there, what's the technology that is the future? Um, there are intermediate technologies like LNG or HVO that we have been testing and are using now to see what's, what's there, what is, how much is it worth and how much can it be scaled? I think the scaling problem, if everybody jumps to HVO, it's going to be a different story and the pricing price points for this will be different. But then um, down the road, um, the question is, is it battery, is it hydrogen, or maybe even something else we don't think about yet. But the infrastructure, if we talk about hydrogen, for example, isn't there yet. So um, the, the greatest challenge for us is how we get rid of this large block of transport logistics costs on the CO2 side. Still not neglecting what we ha all have to do on the social business side and to stay economically viable, but talking about CO2 instead. And um, we also have these programs of, of producing our own e electricity. We build a lot of photovoltaic in Austria, thinking also about other energy sources there. So it's, it's a whole package we are working on with the 14 measures in terms of our sustainability, all linked tightly in our strategy. And we hope to move further there, differentiating now. Probably it's going to be standard in some years down the road. And we think about other differentiations, but we want to be a forerunner there in the industry and, and show what's possible. Thank you very much, Andreas. Um, I mean, like all the Nordic countries, I mean, Norway, you have always been a forerunner as well uh, when it comes to sustainability. And we are keen to hear a bit about what you have been doing and a few examples, cases, activities, please. Thank you very much. Let's not forget that Norway produces quite a lot of oil and gas as well. So, but we don't need to take that discussion here. Um, thanks very much for the invitation. Um, I'm going to share some of our experience when it comes to sustainability in, uh, in the Nordics. Uh, and I'm going to start with a picture that you can see behind me now. Um, and this is our electric fleet on Svalbard, which is an island relatively far north on the globe, which is a showcase of climate change where we see permafrost and uh, ice caps melting, etc. Uh, and it uh, illustrates the dilemma uh, which we have to face many of uh, when working with sustainability in the logistics sector. And the dilemma is that all these electrical vehicles function very well uh, in the cold, harsh environment, but we have to charge on coal-generated uh, energy because that's all that's available on, on Svalbard. Um, uh, but the point is you can't wait for the perfect solution. You have to try as long as it's slightly better than fossil and improving technology and testing, then you should, you should go for it. So uh, I'm going to come back to a couple of dilemmas uh, very shortly about us as a group. We operate in all the Nordic countries. 80% uh, of our revenue comes from uh, not from mail, uh, from the logistics, e-commerce, freight, etc. 13,000 people operate about 4,500 vehicles of our own uh, and uh, have about 40 terminals within the, within the Nordic regions. Um, and 375 years old, in good company with a lot of other postal companies, I think. Uh, and uh, the point is here that innovation and, uh, and making, uh, uh, making new solutions and testing out new things is not a new story for us. We've been doing this for many, many times. Tested our first electrical vehicle in the beginning of the 90s. Uh, and we've been working dedicated with a sustainability agenda now for at least 12 or 13 years, which has been fun. And moving into, obviously, digital marketplaces as well. And I think, again, we also recognize the macro trends that are hitting not just us, but uh, at the moment. Uh, it's economic uncertain times, which makes this challenging in terms of dealing with investments and sustainability work, which uh, needs to be on, on the list. Uh, and also the, the, the depth and the breadth of sustainability. I'm going to come back to that because that's really becoming a bit of an issue for us in terms of how much compliance and reporting that's, that's hitting us. The tsunami was, uh, was mentioned earlier, and we need to balance that. I think that's really important. Uh, and securing talent uh, is important. We see that in our employer branding work, having sustainability high up on the agenda is actually a really important part of our employer branding. So uh, that's, that's valuable for us. 
here's our ESG model. I think everyone's got an ESG uh, people, planet, profit model. Um, and I think there's a couple of things that I want to I um, uh, talk about on the model here and not go through the whole thing. But obviously, in the logistics sector, uh, the main thing for us is obviously the emissions to air, reducing our carbon emissions from our transport. That's, that's really what we've been focusing on for many, many years now, and that's still the most important thing. But the agenda is wide, uh, as we heard earlier on. And one thing that's also quite new for us now that we work on understanding is the effect on nature and biodiversity. There's some global agreements and some regulations that are hitting us there. We need to understand how our operations are affecting biodiversity. And that's something that we and a lot of other Nordic companies are working on. So, so next week, we're meeting all the Nordic uh, climate and, and environmental ministers to discuss this with them. And obviously, as I mentioned, the governance part is important uh, and uh, dealing with all the compliance and obviously making sure that we have uh, profitable operations is the, the foundation of, of sustainability for, for us as it is for many others. Science-based targets. I'm not going to go through our roadmap. We've had science-based targets approved for the last two and a half years. We're now in the middle of, um, of uh, revising those targets uh, as we're actually progressing quite, quite well according to the, uh, the current targets. Uh, and if I want to say something about the challenges within that work, it's uh, doing the transition in your own fleet and your own operations, that's quite easy. But it's doing your scope three, your subcontractors, that's a big challenge, that's a big headache. And I think for most of us, that's where uh, all our missions are. But I would highly recommend the science-based targets methodology. It's very robust, very demanding, and it forces you all the way up to the board to understand how you're going to make this roadmap. Uh, that's, that's enough. And we, uh, we are now uh, reducing our emissions in line with the, the Paris Agreement, which is, which is good. This is a diagram which excludes something quite important. This is Norway. Um, so in Norway, we've got oil and gas big emissions, the big elephant in the room that nobody actually wants to talk about. But if we look away from that and look at all the other sectors, uh, electrifying heavy-duty transport is, uh, is abatement action number two on the list. So it's really important for Norway to reach its climate goals. So, so we get the attention of the, the government, of the ministers, etc., when we try to uh, influence politics and framework requirements around this work. And that's something we use, uh, use unashamedly as much as we can to, to drive the agendas. And yeah, we're not as big as a lot of operators, but uh, we feel that we've progressed quite well. The Paxters were, were, were mentioned earlier. We started developing the Paxters in 2011 with a company in Norway, and now they're exported to many parts of the world. We now have 500 in operation. We have a lot of electrical vans, uh, and we now have 80 large liquid biogas trucks and 70 pure electric trucks, and quite a lot more in order in our, our next procurement process. So basically, we're progressing up the, the scale in terms of electrification, which is interesting. We still see challenging TCO, uh, TCO calculations, uh, depending on use case, two to three times a, a diesel, uh, a diesel uh, vehicle, which is challenging. Uh, but also recently, the finance director became our best friend when we issued out green bonds, where we got excellent interest rates in, in the marketplace, because we can document and prove what we're doing on the climate front. Two days ago, we had a press conference with, uh, with our Minister of Transport in Norway, uh, where we basically uh, announced that we are now building uh, infrastructure for charging or heavy duty char charging uh, in, in the entire country of Norway. Uh, we're doing this, uh, we're putting up 100 points at eight terminals strategically placed, um, basically mostly for distribution around terminals, but we were building line hawk corridors as well as, as the, the technology progresses. And this is also, it's good for us, but also a bit frustrating because we wish that the, the national government uh, would take this responsibility, and they are, but it's going just a bit too slow. Here's the tsunami we heard about. All these acronyms, aren't they lovely? Uh, these are things that we in our business have to understand, uh, both international, national, sector, regulations. Uh, how do you navigate? What do you follow? What don't you follow? How do you not spend all your time on reporting and compliance? How do you spend more time on creating value for, for the government? Uh, I mean, for your company, not for the government. Uh, that's, that's a big issue for us here in Europe, and I should imagine other places as well. My last slide, a bit of, um, a bit of boasting. We've reduced our emissions by 55% since 2012. We now have about half of our vehicles are going on renewable energy sources, and we are uh, hitting half of Norway's population with electric deliveries. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now let's turn to James uh, and, and hear from the UPU and probably I think about how can you transform traditional postal infrastructure. Um, yeah, let's, yeah. 
you see it, it's done. We've finalized. <laughs> you, can, you can make the farewell speech. Can we go back to the slides from James? Is this yours? Yes, that's okay. mine. Okay, so thank you so much for the, um, the opportunity to be the last person to speak because I benefit hugely from listening to this amazing progress, the cutting edge work that's taking place um, uh, across the world. Um, and we also heard a lot of really interesting uh, examples earlier today, the, the first sustainable development panel. So my observation was that most of the discussion taking place was related to the reduction, um, let's say, of emissions for the postal operator and how that postal operator can reduce its harm, uh, maybe make some advancements uh, within the postal sector on sustainable development performance. What I want to talk about is something slightly different. In fact, I would say it's, it's significantly different because I want to talk about the postal network as sustainable development infrastructure. And in the first example, the question was, what can, how can we reduce uh, or how can we improve our sustainable development performance of the postal operator? But I'm asking a, sec a different question, which is, how can the postal infrastructure help other sectors to improve their sustainable development performance? So it's a, an inward looking question versus an outward looking question. And this is really important, I think, strategically, because um, I'll elaborate in a minute, but you know, this is an opportunity for innovation. Uh, we have this amazing infrastructure. So let's have a look at um, how it can be used. And what is the motivation behind this? We, it, it's, we're doing a good thing, that's great. We can use our infrastructure maybe to help other sectors, but goodwill only gets us so far. And what I'm going to talk about is how you can develop uh, identified business opportunities um, by looking at repurposing that postal infrastructure for other uh, sectors. Just to give an example, we, we, uh, we heard already about uh, charging infrastructure. So the first question would be, how can we uh, put in place electric postal vehicles and how can we make sure we're charging them efficiently? But the second question would be, how can we use that charging infrastructure to support the transport sector more broadly? So they're two different questions, but they're related to the same infrastructure. Okay, so what's the process that we would go through to consider this question? The first step is to actually have a look at the postal infrastructure. And it's actually a composite. It's, it's obviously physical infrastructure. We have this amazing, amazing reach, high density of nodes, let's say, in places where we're interacting with the public, uh, post buildings, vehicles. Part of that infrastructure system, uh, knowledge, infrastructures, institutions, and policies that make the thing work, right? But we also have digital infrastructures, uh, social infrastructures. So uh, the employees that we have within the sector, but also the customers, the, the millions, if not billions of customers that we have, they, they form a social network that we can actually mobilize to support broader sustainable development. And last but not least is our trust infrastructure. If we think of trust as an infrastructure that we've developed over hundreds of years, that's incredibly valuable. It's, in, it's valuable to us, it's central to who we are and what we do, but it's also very valuable to other sectors. So just taking that infrastructure, we can start to ask questions of it. So traditionally we would say the function of the postal network is to provide core postal services. That's what we're here for, predominantly. But we know that governments have other priorities. Um, if we look at the Sustainable Development Goals, they've, the international community has literally identified a list of their major priorities globally. And every country will have its different priority SDG, 
sustainable development goal. But typically they, they include things like inclusion. So digital inclusion is a massive issue. Postal infrastructure could be used as public, public digital infrastructure, or it could support the broader public digital infrastructure. We already know that um, during COVID, the postal infrastructure was an essential part of the health network. It became much, much stronger. Similarly, we have uh, contributions to the education sector, to sustainable cities, and last but not least, again, climate. So, the final step really is to actually go out and interact with the uh, representatives of other sectors. So this typically would be the Ministry of Health or the Ministry of uh, Environment. And we're actually encouraging postal operators and other uh, postal sector players to go and ask that question. Have a meeting um, and ask them, what are your priorities? So don't start with the solution, as we already heard from one of my colleagues earlier, Lati, uh, he was basically pointing out, uh, let's ask what the problem is that we're trying to solve. And this identifies, this potentially, as part of an innovation exercise, is huge. Because there's so many problems in the world, and we could apply this infrastructure to help solve those problems. And again, it's not just a nice thing to do. There's, there's business opportunities. There. These are commercial, sustainable development services that can be offered. So, this last slide gives a flavour of some of those social sustainable development services. And we're also starting to develop uh, a menu of environmental sustainability services. I'll skip through these quickly, but um, we have um, all sorts of challenges related to ageing populations. Um, people being uh, older people increasingly on their own, living in different cities to their their families. So there's home checking for, um, services that are being offered by posts. Uh, we certainly know about the value of the post in terms of welfare payments. Uh, increasingly, we're going to see a role for the postal network in disaster response. So on the right here, you see an, a, a mobile post office um, from Japan Post there that was deployed after a, a disaster. Again, COVID uh, kick-started all sorts of innovation around health services. The postal network in China is being used to develop, uh, deliver social aid to particularly uh, to particular parts of the population who are uh, in need, and even uh, climate services, as I'll get onto now. Well, actually, I'm going to give an example related to health. So, can I have a show of hands? Who's wearing glasses? I can't really see you. It's just under half the people in this audience. So, just imagine what would happen if your glasses disappeared, or you've never received glasses. Would you be, what would that impact? I know what happened to my, I, mean, I wouldn't be able to make this presentation. I wouldn't be able to get on the plane, I don't think. I'd, very, I'd struggle to do my job. So just having something like this, which is small and relatively inexpensive, has a massive impact on people's quality of life. Now, about two million, according to the WHO, about two million, uh, sorry, two billion people globally need some sort of, uh, require some help with their eye health. But only one billion have access to eye care services. So the question would be, can the postal network, in this example, be mobilized to provide eye care, eye care services to the, uh, to the hard to reach population? So rem people in remote areas, can they uh, do doorstep tests? Can they, uh, their post offices be used uh, uh, to try on glasses? Can they deliver glasses? Can they be used to return the glasses for recycling? There's a whole potential ecosystem of services around eye health, and that's just one example. So I'm running out of time here. Uh, I could go on forever, but um, what I would say is let's start thinking about how the postal network and the infrastructure of that network can be mobilized to deliver sustainability services. Let's have fun, let's innovate, and let's look for the commercial opportunities providing sustainable development services. Thank you. Perfect, thank you very much. 
I look at the audience. If there is anybody, if you have a question that you want to ask to the, or maybe a comment or anything else, please just raise your hand. I try to, to keep everybody here on the radar a bit throughout uh, the session, so uh, just, just raise your hand. I mean, um, this morning we have talked about, um, there's a question already? Where? I said I have my radar. Ah, oh, okay, yeah. With the light, sometimes it's difficult. <laughs> but please, if there's already a question. Sophie, right? Yes, this is ah. the from French Post. <laughs> Thank you to all the speakers. I have a question to James. Uh, you choose to focus on the network being a sustainable infrastructure, but don't you think that uh, the main responsibility for postal operators is more about transport uh, to be sustainable because it's our core business? Could you please develop a little over targets of sustainable activities you see at UPU level, not only networks, but maybe transports and, and other segment. Thank you. Please, James, it was directly sure. yeah. to you. Um, that's a great question. So I purposely avoided talking about uh, the postal network itself because I wanted to provide a different uh, perspective. But absolutely, you know, the, the, first, the first priority is to get our house in order, to make sure that we are uh, performing uh, as well as we can do as a network, as a sector. Um, what I was proposing was that uh, they're not mutually exclusive. So, so this is an opportunity to actually then say, we've got this great infrastructure, hopefully very green infrastructure. Can we repurpose that? Can we, can we add value by uh, generating revenue, by helping other sectors to achieve their sustainable priorities? Um, but at the UPU, our, our primary focus uh, within sustainable development is climate action for postal operators. And, and I'm pleased to um, echo the, the, the comments earlier that we had about the decision by Congress to have a, uh, a global target for reducing emissions uh, by 2050. Uh, it's 85% by 2050. And we could do more than that. Uh, but at the moment, I think that's a, a very good target to be working with. And a big part of that will be transport and we'll be providing a lot of support or, uh, in different key areas, um, whether that's guidance or whether that's providing uh, a forum for discussion, a matchmaking function, for example, between suppliers, um, knowledge sharing. So there's a lot that we're doing there. So I didn't want to suggest that we shouldn't be doing uh, work on uh, low carbon transport. Um, we should absolutely be supporting that. Uh, but also we can also think more broadly and making that network, that green network pay for itself many times over by making it multifunctional. Colin, you wanted to react as well. Just a short comment. So I'm not going to get involved in the priorities of the UPU, but uh, just as an example, um, I spoke a lot about the decarbonisation work we're doing, but we are also deeply involved in exactly what you're describing at the moment with our governments. Uh, in Norway, we are living longer and not making enough children, so we, we're having a huge social welfare problem in the future uh, with the elderly people living at home. So we are now uh, in pretty deep discussions with the governments in terms of how, how we can provide services uh, nationwide and utilizing the infrastructure, utilizing some of the capacity that is becoming freed up as you know the mail volumes decline even more. So this is definitely the part of our sustainability agenda and it's parallel with the decarbonization. Societal services. Do you also think about this in Austria post at Omniva? Y yes, <laughs> to be short, sure, yeah. I mean, th the question is always then um, in terms of currently the infrastructure is used by e-commerce e and we had good trade-offs with combined delivery and so on to, to match this, but in the end, there will be more and more of these questions. Uh, and, and the use case you showed with checking with elderly and so on, this is a use case discussed quite long already in, in different areas. But I think at some point, as you said, with, with lowering possibilities in the workforce or in, in, in the healthcare system being more and more in a crunch of getting people into the healthcare system, there will be new opportunities and we will be discussing it, yeah. Actually, Omniva has been recently doing specifically that. We've been analyzing two things. One is uh, our network in terms of post offices mostly. How could we use that network better for, for different state uh, services pro providing? Uh, and that would be many things in one. It would be uh, becoming more and more accessible to people because we do have a large infrastructure. So, so uh, there's a social aspect to that, but also, of course, a business case aspect for us. So, uh, so sort of an opti optimization from that side. And we've been testing um, energy-related cooperation and so forth. Another thing we've been actually uh, analyzing is how do we optimize the usage of our fleet? 
we have, uh, well, it's a small region, right? So we have some uh, 650 um, cars or, or vehicles across the Baltics. And there are different times of the day when they are not used so much, right? So how do we optimize that? Can we, you know, can those be used uh, for some other reasons and we, uh, for some other partners and so on? So we've been looking into precisely um, the same direction, so to say. This morning, um, we have been discussing as well uh, the culture, the sustainability culture that is developing in organizations. And I think, Andreas, you have nicely shown it, this triangle, which is really there in the center somehow. But how can you make sure that in every decision that is taken in the company, sustainability plays a role, is considered? Yeah. Not, not easy. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's... it's one massive element is the tone from the top, clearly. I think the more and the more often the, the board and the CEO and so on takes this into their presentations, into their discussions, into their questioning of projects on, on the daily basis, the more it trickles down into the organization and the more also projects and everything that is then suggested are fought from this angle. Um, the other part I would mention is we had on top of the strategy, then a, a large cultural project um, where we then augmented the obvious element of, of um, yeah, efficiency that is there in, in the postal world of, of our culture with, with also elements um, that are beyond that, that, the, that you are, that they go into the area of sustainability, that we want to have a, a reason, that we want to have a, a joy in our work, that we Build on the team culture, the so classical elements, and, and then this, the social aspects that come out of that are much more driven. And we trickled this down till the very shop floor level in all the depots and so on. So we wanted to include everybody in the company and this now the workshops have broadly been held, including also the retail network, so that the, the social dimension of being inclusive, being um, diversity matters and also working on which aspects can be then done on green, but this is only one element there, um, that this is implemented, that everybody knows this and this is something that is fought also in terms of measurements we can do in our own depot, in our own small team. And this is the other way bottom up that helps as well. And that again has to be also started from the top, but then be done until the very late, lowest management level and team level. Katrin, please. I'd add incentivization uh, across the organization. So sustainability being tied to people's personal goals is definitely something that helps. Uh, of course, I can agree with the tone from the top. And then, of course, people in top are also incentivized by different things. Some people want to have an impact and some people are maybe more practical. Uh, when it comes to show me the money uh, type of uh, statement back, then I think there are plenty of examples uh, that can be given towards the top, for instance. If I think about route optimization in, in our industry, it's, it's not only about reducing emissions, it's also hugely efficient uh, and will you know, bring along lesser expenses and, and better gains. If I think about Omniva, Omniva is uh, on the track to IPO, uh, hopefully early 2025, there won't be an IPO without a very good ESG uh, system in the company or your valuation will be simply very different, right? So, so there are different things to approach people. But one thing I've experienced in my previous uh, job, which was in tech sector, was that if you really incentivize, we have personal goals uh, across the organization that will help. And those can be different goals. Of course, people's roles are tied to different areas. They have like more or less impact in different areas. But as a rule of thumb, I would suggest that as well. How do you ensure that uh, in Norway Post or in Bring, sustainability is taken care of in every kind of decision making within the company? Is there some, are there some rules, are there some filters as we, had, uh, as we have discussed this morning? Do you have that as well? Well, I agree with what's just been said by my colleagues here, um, but I think if you can summarize it, it's kind of like a push and a pull situation. Uh, some of it's compliance driven. It's kind of like a license to operate now uh, where you have to, you have to do stuff. Uh, that's not necessarily a sort of a positive culture building signal, uh, but the pull part is, uh, is what does it cost not to do this in terms of customer requirements, in terms of where we're going in the years going ahead. And I mentioned the financing bit as well. 
Um, and we've gone out with quite a few billion kroners in, in financing that's sustainability linked, that we have to document what we're doing on sustainability. And we got, as I said, the best interest rates ever uh, on our financing and best conditions. Uh, and that's, when, that, when that starts rolling, then you get a lot more attention and it's easier to do things. Uh, but the, the difficult answer is as well, that also in big organizations, it takes time. We've been doing this now for you know, 10, 12 years, working systematically with this. Uh, and obviously making sure that uh, the procurement director's only goal cannot be financial is really important. Making sure that the, uh, the property department uh, understands that they have to understand biodiversity. I mean, it's, it's, it's a process. It, it takes time as well. And all the other stuff that's been mentioned, turn of the top, management incentives, all those structures, and then grinding over time. I mean, you, it's, this is always one of those arguments where you say, okay, it costs something, of course. Today, this morning, we also talked about it is rather an investment than a cost, but still, um, when you look at productivity and sustainability, is this kind of contradiction to say, okay, you're sustainable, but of course, productivity has to go down a bit. Your profitability is going down at the end of the day because um, you have to invest more. Or in the long run, if you look at it like this, can it not be that sustainability is rather actually increasing your profitability? Because, I mean, yes, the vehicles are more expensive, but the maintenance is cheaper. And many other things, when we think about a route optimization and elements like this, yes, it is an investment, you have to make changes, but in the long run, there are less trucks on the road and the routes are, are shorter and you need uh, less, uh, fewer drivers, for example. So how, how is this relationship between sustainability and profitability? So I think there is like two sides. On, on the revenue side, there is a chance for some kind of sustainability premium in, a, in maybe in a, in a short or medium term still in some aspects, but it's, it's declining as everybody is, is going there. On the cost side, we are in a lucky situation in logistics that CO2 footprint and productivity in terms of operational efficiency on, on many cases match somehow. So that what you said with route productivity, many of the cases that formerly have been um, shown also in exhibitions like here that it's a cost measure, it's now shown as a sustainability measure because you're getting more efficient in your routing network and so on. S still, there will be things where you have to invest first and it takes time till this is done uh, with a positive business case also in terms of monetary wise and, and, and calculatory. But um, with taking, for example, the E-Fleet, this is getting now more and more in the direction that there can be also be shown a positive business case, but it also is very different across countries depending on the subsidization schemes of the different countries. So it, it's, I think you can't generalize it per se, and, and the government is doing also often a good job to help the environment to there to help also the companies getting this, this um, step we are all working on. Okay. Do we have a few on this question, profitability and sustainability? Well, I mean, just to build on what you, you said, I mean, uh, we see now that we have a positive TCO on, on the light commercial vehicles, electric, and it's, it's, it's cheaper to have a, an electric vehicle than to have a, a diesel vehicle. So that's like, that's like a no-brainer. But it wasn't like that a few years ago. So it's about being optimistic and it's about driving the change, working with the industry, working with the politicians, driving the front, and we spend a lot of time doing this because uh, we, we see it going in the same direction now for even larger and larger vehicles uh, on the electric side as well. So in some use cases for us, uh, an electric uh, large truck is actually TCO neutral. Uh, so it's about taking that bigger responsibility and dri driving the agenda uh, towards 2030. Uh, but, but again, I mean, it's, it's about timing, about how much do you invest, when do you invest, and it's, it's tricky. Mm -hmm. mm. Please, James. If I, may, uh, if I may just build on that, really, I think it's really important to look at the narrow figures, so looking at like-for-like -like replacements, and um, that's absolutely what we need to do, but there is a broader business case that needs to be taken. So, um, as has been referenced a couple of times, the, uh, we need to attract young people into the sector, and if you look at the statistics, what they want is they want to work for a socially and environmentally responsible organization. So, what's the cost of that? What's the benefit of that? You know, so, that, that somehow fits into the calculation. Similarly, you have issues around reputational risk. What's the price of not doing it? I think we've heard that already. So, so there is a um, 
that there's a kind of a whole range of considerations that make that feed into this being a good business decision. Um, and the narrow analysis needs to be done, but I think it has to be set within the context of license to operate, of the, you know, the value um, to investors, um, and also the opportunity to secure external investment. So, you know, we're seeing a huge amount of opportunities in terms of climate finance. This uh, green bond uh, example is, is very interesting because it's cheap money, effectively. Um, so, so, again, it's an opportunity for bringing in external investment from outside of the sector in many cases. So there is this kind of broader business case, which is really important to capture. It's, of course, being who we are on the stage, it's, uh, it's difficult to disagree in these uh, situations. It is about uh, license to operate. Um, and certainly some initial investments are needed, uh, some extra extra money to be put in if you take renewable energy currently it is uh, a bit more expensive however i can bring an example from my uh, again from my previous life in tech sector where we uh, made a uh, pretty big wind energy deal um, and that was prior to the energy prices peaking uh, so the company uh, i worked for and then with was actually pretty happy with that five-year deal uh, so this is an example of a very quick return and the, the example we brought here about route optimization, etc. I guess there are pr many examples of quick returns as well, but in general, sustainability is a long-term game, right? So uh, we all want this climate not to change terribly because then, I mean, there will be all sorts of scenarios and the least of them will be, you know, changing our infrastructure totally to, to withstand uh, the changed climate um, uh, situation and so on and so forth. So in, in it is certainly a longer term game, but there are some also short term gains, I think at least. Yeah. I mean, you, you, have, you have all shown several examples of what you're doing. And of course, one key element is the whole area of mobility. So transformation of the fleets and so on. But there is still this one issue that seems to be unsolved, but which is a big one. Um, where you have been talking briefly, I think Andreas, you talked a bit about it as well. Um, it is the line haul. So, I mean, where do you see that that is going? I mean, for the short distances, you have many different kinds of solutions and with e-vehicles that all works very nicely. But I mean, looking at Norway, for example, here you have a big line haul to the north. And uh, how, how, how are we getting there? What can we expect? Uh, are there solutions out there that are really promising to also solve this issue or? That's a good question. And, and, and I think um, yeah, I'm a technology optimist uh, and things are developing much faster than we thought. Um, and one of the dilemmas in this work as well is, is exactly what you're describing. What kind of technology are you going to aim at? Uh, and what we're hearing, and we have had like a, a long and deep uh, dialogue with uh, with all the OEMs and all the truck manufacturers and all our suppliers, etc. Uh, and and we are now luckily beginning to see a direction that's coming out of all of this. And and the, the short answer is that that everything that can be battery electric should be battery electric. Uh, and some of the e even the heaviest duty trucks are being tested now. On, on we're talking 60 ton trucks are being tested with battery electric. Commercial viability is not there quite yet. Um, but we do see a temporary solution is the liquid biogas, which we have several large trucks in operation of already, um, because that's, uh, it's viable. It's just a, a problem, a matter of infrastructure availability uh, in terms of filling. Uh, hydrogen, we do believe that when you sort of get towards 2030, we're going to be having a small percentage of our heavy duty trucks using hydrogen. Uh, the thing with hydrogen is it's, it's very complicated, but basically hydrogen, I think, is better suited to industrial stationary applications, first, first and foremost, perhaps maritime. Uh, but we do believe that, uh, that, that hydrogen will be a part of the solution. So the summary is battery electric, almost everything, bio-based fuel, whether it's HVO or, or gas, is going is to reduce over time. So I think when we get to 2030, we're going to be quite battery electric with a bit of hydrogen and some, some HVO uh, still left, I think. Short-term mix, but medium long-term, 100% electric. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly when and the timing is going to be tricky to say, but that's the, the, the main direction yeah. that we see. That's the direction the question that I'm seeing on top of building on you is, is on the national scale, then where does the energy come from? On, on the, like, and this Norway is different than it's in Austria, and it's again different than in other countries. So 
Um, we, we are strongly building in Austria, for example, new renewable energy in, at, at scale in Austria, building new wind parks and so on. Obviously, we can't do, do offshore wind parks in Austria, <laughs> but um, there are different chances to, to generate new energy. Um, still, but if, if you put the increased demand you need for electric vehicles and then on top of the, the transport on, on, on the line holes for us, but also the other lorries that are driving around in Austria, that there are quite a few because we're a transit country, um, then there's a lot of energy need. And the question is then, where does this come from? Um, and then you get in the broader picture of, is it again nationally created? You can, in the question of where, do, where does the uh, H2 come from? If it, is it from Austria or do we import it again? So there, there's a national question on that. And it's also the, the question that if you, I mean, you're building your own network now in the Nordics to the north, but you have to decide quite on the technology because you won't build two networks or three networks. And it's the same for us. And then you have the interactions where you need interaction also with the state. What, what's kind of the perspective we are having there and where is an, a platform built for a certain technology and where not. But again, last sentence is we're also seeing that the larger and larger vehicles are getting uh, payback in terms of electrification, but still maybe that's not the, f the full picture, as you also said, that there will be maybe H2 as a second technology or maybe one that we didn't think about yet as innovation is brought. <laughs> now let's maybe move away now from, from the mobility question. Let's move to another part, which uh, of course is also a big issue for all postal delivery companies. Let's talk about the resources like waste and uh, packaging and circular economy. I mean, I imagine you're all very active in that area as well. How, how do you ensure that uh, with your customers you can reduce waste in whatever context? Who wants to take that question? I'm sure you're doing something, right? Or can I, can I take this here that nobody's doing anything? I know that you're doing something. Yeah, I feel like you're doing something. Don't worry. <laughs> <I know> <laughs> but it, it takes time, I guess. It's, it's all about nudging. It's the, the more general also uh, term of, of nudging people towards the right or, or different behaviors and so on and so forth. The same goes for packaging. We have our goal of 50% of, uh, of packaging being uh, reused, recyclable or compostable, uh, sold by us then uh, pretty soon. And I think we can fulfill that because that we can control better. That is about what, uh, what we are selling. If, but if you take the whole circle around uh, what we do and the whole circle of e-commerce, it, it of course takes time. Unfortunately, coming from the Baltics, I, uh, I'm sad to say that uh, if you look at different private consumer research uh, in terms of, you know, what's the mentality around sustainability and sustainable choices, you know, how much do you discuss them, how much do you employ them, actually, um, it is... Uh, it is not in a very good place yet, so those markets have yet a way to go. And I, I guess, you know, all sorts of structural issues like COVID uh, to war to, to anything have contributed to maybe those issues being sometimes less important in households. But uh, I guess uh, slowly but steadily, the consumer behavior is also changing. So what we can do is still the, also the communication and nudging by, by what we offer and then what we uh, engage people to and so on. So we are certainly working with that, but uh, it will take time. When you said 50%, 50 percent, 50 uh, percent as, as a goal uh, yeah, to as replace, a goal. we are not there yet. But yeah. goal when? Do you have that also defined? Oh, we, we are currently actually discussing. I think it will be 27, so it will be pretty, uh, okay. pretty mm -hmm. close. Mm -hmm. Okay. Andreas? So we're having or? multiple fronts. Like you have on the mail side, obviously, the, the work with the large senders that are using still a lot of paper to work together to use recyclable paper and it makes, they are all doing similar programs and they're all getting there themselves because they want to have it. But then on the leaflet side, and Austria is still a large leaflet market, um, there we work actively together to get like also certifications for pro that the, the, the leaflet market is green in terms of what the input factors are, are used and that, that you really push for um, good solutions there as well. And then you have the, the whole e-commerce side with Parcel and there, I mean, uh, it has been presented here also that the, the, there's a flagship project we are doing is this post loop where we um, integrate recyclable packaging in, in a solution where you basically reuse a, a one package 
five to ten times or even more. Um, you basically receive the package, then you, you fold it back together and you return it for the mail flow, which is very interesting because as postal operators, we have the, the post boxes and mailboxes around and this is a very convenient way to return packaging because it's very close to the customers. And then you would refulfill this either with the customer or in our locations and, and, and introduce it again into the cycle. So this is one way where we want to go to really get down this oh, get up the recycling effort there apart from using obviously recyclable material for the packaging and not using plastic and, and, and stuff like that in, in, the, in the cycle and most of the case I would say that, that the customers the B2B customers we're having and the ones that have the large volume they are themselves interested in being sustainable and and we're working on the same in the same boat there and, and it's a good cooperation yeah, for them it's a branding question exactly course, yeah. 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 Colin yeah, not to repeat all those uh, actions that you've described, and we're doing all those, you know, less air, you know, more recycled materials, reusable stuff and that. But, you know, we have one of our largest customers is, is a big Swedish company that makes a lot of furniture and also meatballs. Um, and, and they have uh, circularity very high up on the agenda. Uh, and we have, that's one example. We have several customers. So if you work in the electronics industry and in the clothing industry, fast moving consumer goods, you're getting smacked in the face by a lot of regulations. So we're in discussions with them, how can, how can we help them? And it's more about just facilitating returns. I think it's looking at marketplaces, platforms. So an example that we've worked on is we've invested in a, in a used clothing platform, which is an app which has become very popular in Norway. We'll be on the ownership side, but we also make sure that you know, we get the volumes in, so there's, there's a business part there as well. So looking at digital platforms that facilitate uh, the circular uh, regulations that are coming in for our customers, I think is, is, is an interesting area of opportunity for us going forward, which we're discussing now in the, in the leadership group. Mm -hmm. James. So I was delighted to hear, uh, Colin, you mentioned the circular economy and this platform, because, you know, if I'm going to be on message here, what I was talking about was trying to look at how we can generate revenue from offering sustainability services. That's a perfect example. You know, this is a business opportunity. And one of the areas that we're working on now, trying to develop some guidance at the UPU, relates to e-waste. Um, so we've probably all got a mobile phone sitting at home somewhere that we don't use anymore, but we don't want to throw away for some reason. Um, and one of the reasons I suspect that people aren't recycling their mobile phones is because they're worried about their private information being perhaps um, taken and used against them somehow. So who better to uh, recycle that than a trusted, uh, friendly local post, uh, postman or postwoman? Um, we have this trust infrastructure that I was talking about. We, have, we, are, uh, we are responsible for people's private information every time we deliver a letter. So there's a huge potential there for uh, reverse logistics, for recycling, for collecting these items from people's homes partnering with organizations that will guarantee that they'll wipe the data um, and they'll recycle it. Uh, there's revenue there in all sorts of ways, including uh, providing summary data to uh, organizations at a national and a regional level that want to put in place recycling. They want to know what's the volume of mobile phones that exist, uh, let's say, or, or laptops or whatever. So, they, so this, this kind of sell, selling of the data, not people's private data, but data about the level of waste that's being generated. These are the kind of things that, um, yeah, there's business opportunities there. So you're doing something good, you're contributing to the circular economy um, and helping other sectors deal with their pressing issues. And, and we've been in uh, consultation with some key players on that exact uh, question. How can we help you to resolve some of the challenges and how can we take the opportunities for the postal sector? But Katrin, you said before um, you're a bit disappointed about the market uptake. I mean, we, we have heard, of course, there are the big customers, the senders. For them, it's a branding issue. And uh, they want, of course, to show we are sustainable and we offer you these products. But if the, if the buyers don't opt into it, if they, don't, if they don't choose the option, yes, I want a reusable packaging that I can return and that can then be reused, I don't know, 10 times, 50 times or whatever times. How can we create this awareness? How can we educate uh, the, the, the consumers to opt in, to choose these options? Revert back to continuous and consistent communication, I guess, about the benefits, about the uh, impacts. I think this uh, example of uh, uh, 
um, e example of different devices from laptops to phones or, or anything else. It's a very valid example uh, because that is something everybody can relate to. I'm pretty sure everybody in this audience has many different devices with them and so on. We know that uh, electronic devices have a pretty big impact uh, or a footprint impact on environment and 80%, about 80% comes from their production. So it's all about prolonging the life cycle, uh, which is then about the circularity and then different phases in, uh, phases in it up to uh, responsible uh, disposal and so on and so forth. So I guess uh, we just need to bring different examples that people can relate to, some, you know, loudly speaking facts and so on and so forth. But I think in general, like more philosophically, but also behaviorally, I think we are now witnessing some of the controversial trends and one of them is that uh, there is, a, and I've seen research around that, it's, it's the decreasing agency in people because there are so many structural problems around us and one of them is climate change. Everybody probably now kind of knows and say, uh, admits that this is ongoing but it seems like just too much to, to deal with and then you add to it pandemics and then wars and then everything else happening. So what the research again in private customers uh, case shows that people tend to even young people for in instance in the Nordics who used to be like the ones the Fridays for Future type of forerunners, they're saying that no I'm buying fast fashion again, I want to you know dedicate time to myself, I want to be happy, I'm, I'm not able to deal with the challenges that are too big to deal with. Uh, so, like decreasing agency in people is, is a real problem. On the other hand, we have all this in European context, uh, as, as mentioned before, we have all this reporting, all this regulative environment coming towards us. So, I mean, inevitably, this will become more and more important issue for, uh, for all sorts of stakeholders, from investors to end users and so on. So the importance, the knowledge, the awareness, the uh, you know, ability of businesses to, uh, to evaluate their business from E, S and G perspective will definitely increase and will be more and more important. So there are like different trends ongoing. It's going to be in interesting to see where we land, but all in all, of course, we continue to increase the awareness and then hopefully be better in, in our choices also as consumers. Yeah. I mean, Andreas, you just introduced reusable packaging in a, in a, in a, in a grand scale. Um, how do you ensure that people come on board? How, how, what is your strategy in, in, in making them enthusiastic about, about this new packaging solution? Well, it's together with the, with the ones of the e-commerce shops in the end, so that the, they, have the, they want to have the, the people using them and they are thinking about incentivization options to have that. Um, but it's not always the case. Sometimes we, we're still building on, on actually the end consumer w wanting to be a part of the, of the green movement and that they accept that they have this hurdle of bringing it back. So the question is, what is the incentive there? And do you want to give them or share some of the benefits kind, kind of thing? But it, it's actually something we've been seeing also in the past. The, the pressure from the end consumer is very indirect. So they, they want to build a, the, from a brand that is green and feels green. But if you really go down the road and say, like, are you, would you pay X year more if I, if this is green and this is not green, then the decision is not so clear anymore. And, and, and many studies show that it's probably not the green one that is chosen. So the capital markets, the B2B customers are having this stronger pressure currently than the direct end consumer sometimes is. But I wouldn't say that there's no pressure, but it's an indirect one. And it's not something that is for the payment stream or for, them, for the money stream from them at least. Yeah. So, so in the end, to, to make it really something that flies and is successful, it mustn't cost more for the end consumer. A lot more, at least. At, right. not, 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 a lot, not a lot more. And, and it, it's a very indirect one. So if the, if the brand that has in the whole image of the brand also green, and that's how they differentiate themselves, and that's why they're selling more products, and that's why these products are also green, and that's why they also can afford a green delivery, then that's the way that the end consumer is then paying indirectly because they choose this shop than the other. But mm. then again, as you just said, in terms of in times of economic need, you may choose other brands then because something is just cheaper there and, and not buy from, uh, buy from there. Yeah. Yeah. But some really basic things are, you know, to make it really simple for the consumers, I think what works in our case, for instance, pretty well is that we have 
reusable packaging available in post offices. So you can leave yeah. your old package or you can take something if you want to wrap it up and it's reusable. So that is kind for of free? easy and simple. Yeah, that's for free. Okay. You can buy, of course, also like the really one, nice so reusable packaging, but there's also a place where you can swap, so to say. So you have, you know, you open your package, you receive a package, you open it, you leave it, or, or you okay. want to wrap a package and there's something. So something like that works. Uh, and then, yeah, it cannot be terribly more expensive than the alternative choices. I think that would be a good start. Yeah, yeah just to build on what's been said already, a few days ago, uh, the CEO of uh, the second largest airline in Norway had a big headline in the media saying, our customers are lying to us. Uh, because they've done some analysis saying that, uh, you know, we will pay for a you know, greener flying service, less carbon emission, etc. But the statistics show that they don't. So there is an option to do it, but they just don't, even though it doesn't cost much more to compensate for, you know, flights. Uh, and a couple of reflections I've had is uh, um, a consumer engagement around this topic has never been a real driver for us. It's, it's obviously more the B2B situation. And, and I think greenwashing is also an important part of this. It's quite complicated for a normal person to understand what does it mean if you plant trees? What does it mean if you buy, you know, climate quotes or whatever? I mean, it's how do you compensate? It's, it's a very complicated issue. Uh, and and as, as has been said, yeah, I think there's a certain amount of exhaustion as well about climate change and the, this, this feeling of, of hopelessness. So I think we just need to, as companies, take the responsibility as much as we can uh, you know, for our own sakes, uh, with all the other stakeholders that are driving this, and not necessarily the consumers. That's never been an issue for us. And not necessarily trust the consumers and what they say. <laughs> not always, at least. James, do you have a few on that as well? Uh, yeah. Um, maybe, well, I would, I would trust their uh, responses. So, you know, it, it, irrespective of what they say, if there's a product, let's say, or a green option that's... Um, not easy to use, or it's not clear what it's what the benefits are, or if it doesn't fit um, align with their values, then they won't use it. So I think we need to perhaps. I mean, it's an interesting question for uh, you know psychologists and social scientists to actually kind of engage. Maybe we should be engaging in that respect to say, you know, what is it that people actually want? You know, because I, I do believe there's a huge uh, green market, there's a huge amount of green consumers there. But perhaps sometimes those products and services are not quite aligned with their values and, and uh, they may not tell you directly why. Um, so, so I think there's a big opportunity, but perhaps it's just the subtlety of trying to um, untangle that motivation from what people say, because obviously what people say and what people do are not always completely aligned. Um, so I think there's, yeah, there's an interesting piece of work that can be done there. And I think uh, you're mentioning about uh, research. I think we should be engaging with the research community a lot. There's a lot of researchers out there, a lot of interesting work, so. Perfect. The time is over. We have to stop here. Uh, it's uh, it's 16.45 and I've promised that we'll be on time, so <laughs> there is no way I can go over it. But please give a big applause to our panel here for this last session. <laughs> and to close this year's UPU World Leaders Forum, I invite the Director General of the UPU to do the official closing. Please, Mr. Matoki. And you have to leave. You know. Maybe we can go down. Thank you very much, Dr. Moderator. <laughs> so, uh, distinguished panelists, dear guests, colleagues, and friends, good afternoon. It is my sincere pleasure to join you in my first ever UP World Readers Forum. I extend my thanks to UKI Media for their strong support in organizing this however UPU event within Post and Parcel Expo. Throughout the past two days, you have had a broad range of perspectives from postal decision makers. They have painted a picture of what the future could look like and defined the strategies that we need to follow in order to get there. Thank you again to all the panelists for your very, very constructive advice and suggestions. 
Now it is clear that the making up of our business is changing. We must keep the customer front of mind and strengthening the quality of service provided throughout the physical and the digital networks. While there is no one size fits all diversification strategy. So I believe the UPU has the tools to help post find tailored solutions. Forums, one of the main focal point is sustainability. Sustainability is a topic that has gained enormous momentum, strong sustainability performance benefits operational performance and can attract talent to our operations. It provides an opportunity for us to position the postal network as a key partner for government, UN agencies, and NGOs to meet their own sustainable goals. We should not ignore these opportunities. Concerning the sustainability, as you have already know, and also someone mentioned, uh, thanks to your cooperation and the external Congress, even just before three weeks ago, we uh, fortunately, the every member countries agreed to the initiative so-called Green Package. It is actually, thanks to the other member countries, a kind of understanding, and the, but the unfortunately, it should be implemented only by voluntary contributions. But today I know there are so many operators keen to the really uh, climate actions. So I believe very soon so many postal operators kindly voluntarily contribute to this fund and the will the UPU International Bureau will move forward this initiative very soon, I hope. And uh, to build a sustainable future for ourselves and logistics and cross-border e-commerce, we must also work, work on our data. The UPU supports this through its global postal model, its compliance project, and the move towards paper-free services. We are also supporting the development of regional transport hubs to improve global connectivity. This includes cooperation with wider postal sector players. Today also, we discussed, as a really this very good substantial discussion for trust. The trust of customers has long been one of our most precious assets. Much of this trust has been built upon and generations of face-to-face -face, uh, contact with postal employees. No doubt, the sector moves deeper into the digital world. However, it is vital that uh, we maintain this trust. At the same time, the UPU has established all the regulations, standards, technological solutions, and the networks to strengthen the digital trust and the security of its members. I would like to thank all of you for the open, honest conversations and really very, very active discussions and that took place during this forum. And so it has become an essential platform for postal and logistic readers from all continent and market to share ideas and strategies. I trust that these discussions have also brought each of you many opportunities for collaborations. I hope you will join us again next year. As you know, next year's 150th anniversary of UPU. I hope the next year's forum will be something more special than this year. Thank you very much for your kind attention.